I was a professor at Kent State University for 10 years. And it seemed uh, over the course of those 10 years that the students who used the NIV or the NASB or the New King James had difficulties in their walk with the Lord or psychological problems or they come into my office crying or something like this. And this phenomena, repeated year after year, uh, catapulted me into my exhaustive uh, six-year collation of Bible versions. And I'll give you an example of what happened. When a young woman came into my office. She was crying, and uh, they knew I was a Christian. My students did. And she was a Christian also. So I said, oh, honey, let's look at your Bible. Let me show you Luke chapter 4. Jesus said he came to heal the brokenhearted. So we opened it up, and I knew that verse from my King James Bible. I'd used the King James Bible all my life, but I really didn't know that there was a difference. I really hadn't paid much attention to any differences. In fact, I'd used a number of other versions myself, comparing things and, uh, for additional study. And I want to show her Jesus came to heal the brokenhearted. And in chapter 4, it wasn't there. It was completely omitted. And I thought, well, now that's strange because Jesus was reading in the synagogue out of Isaiah chapter 61. And in fact, he has said that Jesus came to heal the brokenhearted. And so I thought, well, I'll try another verse. So I went to the Psalms where it said, um, his mind is kept in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee. And I thought, you know, dear, dear young lady, you need to keep your mind on the Lord Jesus Christ. And not to think about boyfriends who've broken up with you or you got a seed in chemistry or something like this. And so I want to show her this verse in her New American Standard Bible. And the on the had been taken out. And so I was befuddled because it says in Thessalonians, comfort one another with these words. And I couldn't comfort this young lady. And I went home and I was so upset. And I thought, you know, what's happening here? Uh, and on another instance, a young man came into my office and um, he was talking to me about Isaiah 14. And he said, um, Isaiah 14 about Jesus Christ, the way the New uh, International Version and the New American Standard Bible imply, or is it about Lucifer, um, as the King James Version indicates? And I thought, oh, my heavens, I said, that's quite a dichotomy there, you know. And so I looked in his NIV, and it, apparently the name of Lucifer had been removed. Now, I knew this, this was impossible because the Hebrew word there is Hillel. It's a proper name. And so it wasn't the word for morning star. They had substituted the word morning star, and in the footnote in the NASB, it took you to uh, Second Peter, and then that would also again take you to Revelation, and then those two footnotes take you to Jesus Christ, who is the bright and morning star, Revelation 2 and Revelation 22. And so this young man had gotten the idea that that the fall of Lucifer in Isaiah 14 was about Jesus Christ falling. And um, Dick Spangler, who is uh, uh, was the editor of the New Age Journal, is a Luciferian. And he has always said Christ is the same force as Lucifer. And this was the impression this young man was getting. I thought, almost certainly not. You know, Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Lucifer is a created being. He's a fallen angel. And, you know, he'd gotten this kind of messed up theology. And I, and I prayed to the Lord. I said, the Lord, and I love my students. At that time, the Lord had not given me any children of my own. And I love these young people. And I said, Lord, you know, I need to look into this. Give me some time. And so, um, I became disabled. I went on a disability retirement, and it was the Lord's blessing in disguise, and I managed to lay in bed for about six years. And in the course of laying in bed for six years, collated word for word, every single word in the new versions, comparing each one. And as I started to collate, um, I, I was just so shocked to find some of these things. I'd be glad to share some of the things that I found um, as I was collating these versions. Now, um, you know, people might ask, how can I know the truth about Bible versions? The Bible is our final authority in all matters of faith and practice. So we look at the Bible. What is truth? He said in John 17, thy word is truth. So we know we go to the word to find out what the truth is. Now, um, who is a liar? Okay, we want to know who's telling the truth and who's telling a lie. Which version is telling us the truth and which version is telling a lie? Uh, First John 2.22 said, who is a liar? But he that denies that Jesus is the Christ. He is antichrist that denies the Father and the Son. And so as I was going through these new versions, they would snatch away the word, words like Christ. And I found that the word Christ had been taken from Jesus' name 43 times. Now, in the NIV, there are 64,000 missing words. Okay. When you print these new versions up on a computer disk, they come up one disk short. And Gordon Fee, who's uh, one of uh, the continent's preeminent textual scholars, said, in fact, the new versions are 10% shorter. And so the reason it's 10% shorter is because of um, these many, many missing words, and many of them are of uh, much doctrinal import. Let me give you some examples. Um, as I said, the NIV takes out uh, Christ 43 times. It takes out God or Jesus Christ 176 times. 
Uh, the NASB takes it out 198 times. And um, let me give you one example. In um, Galatians chapter 4, verse 7, it says an heir of God through Christ. Okay? And the new verse is just as an heir of God, and it draws through Christ. Now, a Hindu would like to think they're an heir of God. But we're an heir of God through Christ. It's the only means of getting to the Father. Um, in First John 4, chapter 3, it says, in the King James Version, Every spirit that confesseth confess not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of Antichrist. Now, the NIV takes 13 words out of it, but I just repeated to you. They take out the essence of that verse, and they take out Christ has come in the flesh. And they take out and this is the spirit of Antichrist. So what they have is every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. So they're denying that Jesus is the Christ. You know, when Jesus was on the cross, the mockers were saying to him, If thou be the Christ, if thou be the Christ, come down. You know? And who is Antichrist that, that doesn't say that Jesus is the Christ? So this was very important. Uh, now that verse in 1 John 2.20 uh, 2, 2, goes on to say that uh, whosoever denies the Son the same has not the father. All the religions of the world have a father. You know, in Hinduism, uh, we have the Hindu gurus, and they're called Baba. Baba Ram Das was a, uh, a Harvard professor, and he took the name uh, Baba Ram. That's a Baba, means father. All the religions of the world have a father. But what's happened in the new versions is that the father is there, but the Lord Jesus Christ is gone. Let me give you an example. Ephesians 3.14. The King James says, I bow my knees uh, unto the father of our Lord Jesus Christ. The new version should say, I bow my knees unto the Father. The Lord Jesus Christ is gone. Now, a Hindu could read that and say, I bow my knees unto the Father, you know, uh, Father Abitur or whatever it is, but not unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. A Muslim would never say that. The reason some of the universities were so important to me is because uh, as a professor at Kent State University, uh, we were allowed to, students were allowed to have a table. And I used to take my lunch hour and I put Bibles on the table and tracks and all this sort of thing. And students from, uh, Countries all around the world, Hindu students, Muslim students, uh, would come and talk to me about Jesus Christ. And I had to prove to them that Jesus Christ was God in the flesh. Now, Muhammad's not God in the flesh, and Krishna and Buddha, these aren't God in the flesh. And I had to explain to them the difference between Jesus Christ, who was God, manifest in the flesh, and, you know, who they were worshiping. And so there were certain verses that I always used, and I was co- as I was collating these versions, I found it. Those very verses that were the sword of the Spirit that I could use to help these young people, the sword had been sheathed, and I couldn't help them if I was using one of these other versions. For instance, um, God was manifest in the flesh. I used that verse uh, about three or four weeks ago and speaking to a young Hindu person. He said, who is Jesus Christ? He's a teacher. He's a wonderful man. I said, no, he's God manifest in the flesh. Now, in the NIV and in the NASB and all the new versions, it's he who was manifest in the flesh. So probably the best attestation to the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ is God. I couldn't say he who was manifest in the flesh. You really can't. You really can't use that to communicate the deity of Jesus Christ to someone. Um, now, that verse that I just gave you, uh, Ephesians 3.14, that's repeated time after time after time. Let me give you another example. Um, Ephesians 3.9, the King James says, God who created all things by Jesus Christ. Okay, the new versions take out by Jesus Christ. And so they've got God who created all things. Everyone would agree to that, but the religion of the world wouldn't agree to by Jesus Christ. This happens time after time after time. After time. Um, Sandra Pruza came out and she asked a good question that people are asking back there. What, how do you know that these words were not added to the King James when it was translated? I mean, what, what makes you think the King James was is so perfect? Right. That's an excellent question. That's a question that many people have, so I'm glad you asked that. And it takes us back to the history of the Greek text. As you know, uh, the original autographs were originally written in Greek. And today we have 5,000, 5,300 names for the extant that attest to uh, what is in the New Testament. What should we believe? Is it, you know, God manifest in the flesh or is it he who is manifest in the flesh? Okay. Of the 5,000 manuscripts, 99 and 4,400% agree with each other. Now, this is how the Lord would have to be, isn't it? In the book of Acts, he says, the word of God multiplies. Mm-hmm. And um, not, this 99 and 4,400% agrees with the fuller King James text. Okay. And so, the only manuscripts that don't agree about these truncated so manuscripts. So that's fuller? Fuller text. In other words, uh, okay. 64,000 missing words in the NIV are because they were translated from different manuscripts. Okay. Okay. Um, 
Let me explain a little bit more about that. Now, there's so many questions I want to ask you, <laughs> and I'm sure a lot of them are what you are out there saying on the edge of your chair. Ask for her, okay. but I want to give her <laughs> your due, okay? Uh, let me read a quote from the director of the British Museum, okay? He said, quote, referring to those that 99% that agree with the King James having this fuller reading with, with the 64,000 words in it, okay? He said, this is the text found in the great majority of manuscripts until 1881. It held the field as the text in practically universal use. And so when they collate the British Museum, they collate the Church Fathers. There are 87,000 citations from the Church Fathers. They agree with King James Version 2 to 1 and 3 to 1 for important verses. And so throughout the history of the text, all of the Greek manuscripts that we have, almost all of them, agree with this fuller text, with these fuller readings. Okay, now what happened in 1881? You know, this was a text in universal use, not just in Greece, but in Syria, um, all over Europe, the Celtic Bible, um, but all the versions that have been translated, the Italian uh, um, Bible, the Hungarian uh, Bible, the French Olivetan Bible, the Spanish Valera Bible, the Russian uh, Great Bible, all of these, like Luther's German Bible, they all throughout history have agreed with this fuller King James type of text. Okay. Now, in 1881, two gentlemen, Westcott and Hort, okay, who were spiritualists. Now, the average Christian, the average theologian, has really never gone back into the history of these people. As a matter of fact, someone who interviewed me on a radio show, and they knew sort of the history of Westcott and Hort. They interviewed um, one of my counterparts that follows me after I go on the radio show from representing the other side of the issue. And they said to this gentleman, uh, what do you know about Westcott and Hort? And he said, nothing. Have you ever read their biographies? No. So people really haven't gone back into the lives of these people and, and explored and found the things I found. So I don't really blame them. It isn't that, that, that these people sat down and said, yes, let's get a Greek text written by a spiritualist. See, I don't, I don't believe these men did this. As a matter of fact, let me quickly read a quote to you um, from Dr. Frank Logsdon, who was on the New American Standard Bible Committee. Okay, He was the co-founder of the New American Standard Bible. This wasn't just a pastor who used the New American Standard Bible. This was the man who co-founded it. And he said, quote, I must, under God, renounce every attachment to the New American Standard Version. I'm afraid I'm in trouble with the Lord. We laid the groundwork. I wrote the format. I helped interview some of the translators. I sat with the translators. I wrote the preface. I'm in trouble. I can't refute these arguments. He said, it's wrong. It's terribly wrong. It's frighteningly wrong. And what am I going to do about it? He said, I used to laugh with others. However, in attempting to answer, I began to sense that something was not right about the New American Standard Version. I can no longer ignore these criticisms I'm hearing, and I can't refute them. And he went on to say, you can say the authorized King James Version is absolutely correct. How correct? 100% correct. And this man, before he passed away, went around the country to different churches and spoke to them. And this quote is a, a tape recording from um, one of the speeches that he gave when he was going around to different churches. Right? Oh, he, he was from uh, Largo for a while. Right, right. Absolutely. We had him in. He used to Super speak at uh, yeah. our church all the time. Uh, this particular, the message, this one has been endorsed by Warren Wiersbe. Right, right. A tremendous man. Uh, in, the, in the caliber of Lux. That's right. I have a very, very blessed line from the writings of Warren Wiersbe. Do you remember in the uh, in the Bible, Peter was rebuked by the Lord twice. Uh, Peter had just finished saying, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And, and Jesus said, Flesh and blood hath not revealed this unto you, but my Father which is in heaven. In other words, the Father had just revealed that to Peter. And then ten minutes later, Peter said something to him. He said to him, No, you don't have to go to the cross. Don't go to the cross. And Jesus said, Get thee behind me, Satan. In other words, at Peter, as great as he was, even in the book of Acts, when his shadow passed by people, that would be healed. And it says of Barnabas, because he was a good man, like one of years, and full of the Holy Ghost. But now when you get into Galatians, it says, Paul, um, Peter, and Barnabas, Galatians chapter 2, it says, they walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel. There was something wrong. And Paul had to rebuke. And can you imagine Paul? Rebuking Peter. Peter had been an apostle a long time before Paul. Paul was, you know, a uh, string man, okay? And, but Peter took that rebuke, humble enough. And, uh, the way we get saved, we have to have a humble heart. We have to admit that we're wrong. Sure. And we have to keep that humble heart as we're going along. And so, I don't think that any of these men, like Warren or anything, teach that they're infallible. And I think we said, you know, our, 
are you a cell? Well, I think they strongly object, and I think they might have a heart like Peter, like Dr. Long. Well, in fact, I one of the, the, the biggest theologians I'll have, I'll ask them the question, and they'll say, Herman, I have to tell you, mm-hmm. okay. and I'll have someone that isn't even near in their class, but is a very well-known person, and you'll ask them a question, they can answer for you. Mm-hmm. Isn't that interesting? This person has an answer for every question you ask them in the Bible, without question. And the theologian, who has spent years and years and years studying the Bible and all the translations or whatever, will come back with the answer, Herman, I have to tell you, I don't know. That's good. That's a, that's a humble heart, and that's the kind of heart we need to keep. But I've had a number of calls from people who are on these new version committees. A gentleman from the New King James Committee called. He's buying the books by the cases, and he's taking them to the churches where he's been. A gentleman who raised a million dollars for the contemporary English version has been calling me. He's very kind. He said, we didn't know these things. We didn't know the history of the text. We didn't know uh, about what we got in court. And what about you? You never did tell us about uh, uh, those two people. Okay. Um, when... The New Age movement itself traces back the history of the current channeling movement. Now, the channeling movement is where uh, it's actually demon possession, where a demon comes into a person and speaks through that person, okay? And this is something that's a national Christian. And um, these people, when the New Agers themselves trace back to the current channeling movement in their own journals and their own material, trace it back to Westcott and Horton. So when you read books on the history of psychical research, for instance, they will have interleaving in those pages or in their index that will say, um, you know, psychic reading, uh, channeling, uh, ghost writing, inspirational writing, um, all the sort of things. God and for. And when you go back to it and you find out what these meant, they were fathers of the channeling movement. They had a club called the Ghost Rekill, and they engaged in spiritualism. Uh, Westcott Farm said, my father was, for lack of a better word, a spiritualist. He engaged in necromancy. Necromancy is an abomination. These men took the Greek text 1881 had been used by the church for almost a thousand years, and they changed it. They took two manuscripts, okay, Vatican and Christus manuscripts, and they changed that text that had been used by the church all that time and omitted all of these things that were fine, like Jesus, they healed the brokenhearted. They omitted that, okay. Um, now, the reason they did that is because they were, they could be very, very comfortable in a unity Christianity church. I don't know if you're familiar with unity. But they, when I read that, they're writing, they would be very, very comfortable. They are very, very comfortable in a new age church. They were very much Platonic. If you look up in the uh, Encyclopedia of Religion and Ethics of the Life, it will list them under Neoplatonism or Alexandrianism. Uh, and they, they said that the modern expressions of the Platonic movement. And they liked these manuscripts because they had been written way back in the third century by men who were Platonists at that time. Origen was a Platonist, Marcone was a Platonist. And so they had a little bit different view of Jesus. He was God, yes, but then we could also be God. And so that's like the dichotomy in the new version. Yes, Jesus is God over here, then maybe it's a little bit watered down over here because Vaticanus and Sinaiticus manuscripts were created around the year 330 by Constantine to do just that. Constantine had taken over uh, the Roman government at that time and it was in turmoil. Uh, the, the Christians were being killed. Diocletian was uh, burning all the Bibles. That's like we don't have any, you know, first century or second century manuscripts because Diocletian was burning Christians along with their Bibles. So Constantine was, like it says in Daniel, by peace we shall destroy many. He said, let's have peace. Uh, God forbid that we should assail one another. And so he had Eusebius um, take the manuscripts of origin and write them out and create 50 Bibles. And these scholars believe that these 50 Bibles that were created by Constantine are the Vatican and the Sinaiticus manuscripts that we're seeing being used today. Now, this is what's very, very interesting, what you uh, said about, you know, why are they different? Nestle's 26th edition, that is the Greek text underlying all of these new versions, okay? That someone bought a Greek text at a Christian bookstore, it was probably the Nessus 26th edition. That Nessus 26th edition, 26th edition is, in essence, the Vicarious and Sinaiticus manuscripts. Okay? It is not the Texas Receptus or the Bible that underlies the King James Version. It's very, very different. Now, because of the uh, discovery of the Papra, 92 Papra have been collated since the NIV came out, since the NASB came out, okay? Because of that, Nestle's 26th edition has changed in 500 places back to the King James Version. So in essence, the people who were carrying around the King James for those 20 or 30 years 
They're the only people that had those 500 readings that scholars like Warren Wiersbe and people like that now believe should be in the Bible. They're back in the 26th edition, but the new versions, the Nessus 21st and the Nessus 23rd, um, are where we get the NIV and the NASB from. Those did not include the collation of the Packer. So a gentleman like uh, the president of the University of Chicago, past president, he's now passed away, uh, Caldwell, he's collating P66, the oldest Packer in the world, and he said P66 agrees with the King James Version. As a matter of fact, when he's collating P66... So when he says agrees, what does that mean? Uh, he would mean that, in essence, that when King James says, has a fuller reading, okay, those extra 64,000 words, uh, that... So the word you're, you're not talking about a person or a individual. You're right. talking about in the sense of the word mean. More words. More words. Complete. Yes. Right. Okay. More like, words. like the Lord Jesus exactly. Christ. Just so we, we understand. Mean. We're not talking Thank about you. a translation. But yeah, the fuller translation. Right. Because there's so many of them. People might have said, I need to go out and get the fuller translation. <laughs> That's an excellent point. But let me read you a quote from uh, what Hort said about his Greek text. He said, strike blind one much evil would result from the public discussion. I have a sort of craving that our text should be cast upon the world before we deal with matters likely to brand us with suspicion. I mean, a text issued by men already known for, already known for, his peers at that time knew that they were spiritualists, already known for what will undoubtedly be treated as dangerous terrorism, will have great difficulty finding its way to regions which it might otherwise reach. Evangelicals seem to me perverted. And this is what the man said who created this text, okay, that was used, it was created in 1881, it was diametrically opposed to what was happening. As a matter of fact, he said, uh, I'll finish that quote, he said, uh, the angry objectors have reason for their outcry. But at that time, there was a hue and a cry. And a number of scholars came forward and they said, you know, you're creating a new Greek text. As a matter of fact, back then it was called the new Greek text. Well, now if you go to a Christian bookstore and ask for the Greek text, or if you buy an interlinear, it will be the West part of Greek text. But I suspect, no, I yeah, I suspect that people don't know about these men. You don't know what they were involved in. They were not only involved in this ghost guild. They had a club called the Hermes Club. And James Webb, who was a secular historian, said the Hermes is the entry point for scholars. And the occult. These men were scholars, okay? They weren't uh, black arts, you know, you know, sort of people. They were definitely scholarly people. You say uh, a surprising number of new version editors have permanently lost their ability to speak. Five can still count. Is that right? That's right. Okay, uh, now what do you attribute that to? In other words, the, the, the first. Right, the living, the one, the, the man, right? The right, living lost his place. Yes, right. Now, remember Zachariah. Zechariah was a godly man. Zechariah was the father of John the Baptist. So this is not, you know, Scott, this is the father of John the Baptist. When the angel appeared to him and said, you know, you're going to have this son, you didn't believe me. It's because I believe it, not my words. He lost his ability to speak. So a, a, a Bible translator loses their ability to speak. as not saying they're demonic, they're satanic, they sit around having set lunches and, and things like this. I'm not, you know, making this implication at all. I'm just saying, Thou believe it's not my words. You know, we have to have final authority. When we have five or six different translations, and the pastor's reading for one, everyone has a different one. There's confusion, and God is not the author of confusion. It, it, it loses, the word of God loses its power. Like, you know, what is Satan's device? Because we're not ignorant of his devices. Satan cometh immediately and taketh away the word. Lest they should believe and be saved. That's his device. He takes away the word. He comes immediately and tries to take away the word. You ask, what does he do? He takes away. Why the new version has something taken do away? Do people memorize the new versions like you did the King James? Well, you know, I don't find that they do it. You know? That's a very interesting question. I spoke at a Christian school recently and I was talking to them and they communicated to me the exact same thing that they're saying. Mm -hmm. Students cannot memorize the NIV. The reason they can't is because the King James version uses Anglo Saxon words. Anglo Saxon words are always one or two syllable words. Okay? Now, uh, in the new version, they use Latinized words. Latinized words have prefixes and suffixes. They're always four syllables. Okay, let me give you an example of the difference between King James. Yes. 
Most of them. Most of them. Can you do it in that last one? Um, <laughs> if I could be here, I can't. The King James says, rose up to play. Okay. NIV says, indulge in revelry. Okay. The King James says, told. The NIV says, conscripted. I don't even know what conscripted means. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. Um, the King you're, a, you're a university professor. <laughs> 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 This is Brother Hutchings inviting you once more to the broadcast of the Southwest Radio Church. From the program today, we're going to be visiting again with Gail Rippinger, author of New Age Bible Versions, and also, Which Bible is God's Word? We're going to be talking with Gail just for an update about what she's been doing and the response she has been getting from these books. We'll have an update from her about what others are saying about her work. I know from the response that we have gotten that perhaps no one in recent years has caused more people to take a closer look at their Bibles than Gail Rebinger. You know, quite a few writers who call us and say, we went to the bookstore to get your book, the New Age Bible version, and we were told that the bookstore does not handle it. Why, in your opinion, does not bookstores, or many bookstores at least, not on your book? Well, quite possibly because the majority of their uh, revenue comes from the sale of NIVs or NASBs, and they are given a special discount. They're given a 50-60% discount on NIVs and NASBs. But if anyone goes out, goes to a bookstore out there and they ask the bookstore, uh, clerk, which Bible do you recommend? They're not going to recommend the King James because typically the discount is only 40%, and if they sell an ASB or an NIV, they'll make a 50, 60% profit margin. The same thing happens with pastors. I know that the NIV and Zonderman and some of these people had pastors' breakfasts where they offer financial incentives to pastors who will switch their church over to the NIV. And obviously, the pastor's not going to admit this to the congregation. So there's love of money is the root of all evil, and I suspect that's what's happening to you know. Something very interesting has happened in the new verse. It's completely omitted in many verses the word holy in identifying things. For instance, in Second Peter chapter 1, verse 21, where we read about holy men, the NIV and the new verses drop the word holy off, so they just have men. In Matthew 25, verse 31, James talks about holy angels. The new version of holy, again, just having angels. Thessalonians 5.27, uh, the King James is holy brethren. The new versions just have brethren. Uh, Revelation 22, verse 6, as holy prophets. The new versions just have prophets. And finally, in Revelation chapter 18, verse 20, the King James has holy apostles and prophets. The new versions just have apostles and prophets. They've taken the holy from the holy scriptures. There are only two holy things on this earth now. We have the Holy Spirit with us, and we have the holy scriptures. And the enemy would love to take away the Holy Scripture from us and give us a counterfeit Bible. Now, there are five places, new versions, that identify the Holy Ghost. The third person of the Trinity is indeed holy, and his work is holy. But in these five places, John 7, 1 Corinthians 2, Matthew 12, Acts 6, and Acts 8, they have taken the word holy from Holy Ghost, and they simply say spirit. And I think what's happened here in these last days, Noah, is prophesied in Ezekiel chapter 22, verse 27 and 26. It says there's a conspiracy of prophets. They have put no difference between the holy and the profane. And so they really can't see the difference between a holy Bible and an unholy Bible. Some of the new versions have gone so far as to introduce the term, the religious term New Age, the political term New World Order into the new Bible. For instance, in Matthew 19, verse 28, where the King James Version has the regeneration the Good News Bible and the Contemporary English Version, as well as a number of others, have changed that to the New Age. They're actually looking for the New Age right there. That's the New World and the Revised Standard Version in this place, and the Easy to Read Version. In Hebrews chapter 9, verse 10, where the King James talks about Reformation, the NIV has the New Order. So there we see the New World Order again. The Good News Bible also has the New Order. Now, in Revelation 20, verse 4, where it talks about the former things, the NIV has the old order. So what's happening in the new version, in 2 Corinthians 5.17, in the King James we read, old things are passed away, behold, all things are become new. They're, they're talking about 
us becoming new creatures in Christ Jesus in the King James. However, in the New English Bible, it's the old order has gone. The new order has already begun. So people's minds are being softened up to, to accept the new age, new political world order, and it's being done right through the pages of the NIV and the Good News Bible and the contemporary English version. Now, the new version, or the NIV in particular, has made a terrible change. They have taken away Jesus Christ, who is the chief cornerstone. You read about that in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 20. He's the head of the corner. Okay, when you know when you build a building, the cornerstone goes on the bottom and it accepts the angles and the directions for the rest of the building. Jesus Christ is the foundation of our Christianity. The household of God is built upon the foundation of Jesus Christ. Okay, in the new version, they've changed that at the corner in Matthew 21 and 12 and Luke 20, Acts 4 and 1 Peter to the cap. So, you know, the capstone historically has been this all-seeing eye of force representing the Antichrist. So they've made a very poor change, changing from something that's on the foundation of something to something that's on the tippy top that's shaped like a pyramid. So that's a very, very bad change in the new version. Well, the other day, someone recommended that we have a minister on our program, a guest speaker, he'd written a new book, and we uh, received tapes, messages based on the book, and also the book. Well, the tapes were fine. When we went to the book, the book used NIV to reference it. We call him up and say, why did you read from the King James on the tape, and yet your book is in the NIV? He said, well, I submitted the manuscript, and the publisher would not publish it unless I used the NIV. So they changed from the King James to the NIV scripture. So publishers are doing this because they want authors to use the newer versions and particularly the versions that they publish. They are trying to force the King James out of publication so they can use the newer versions and sell the newer versions. Gail, I read here in your comments on the Antichrist that the newer version from First John 4, we say every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not a God, where the King James says every spirit that confesses not that Jesus Christ come in the flesh is not of God. Could you tell us about that change and some of the other changes that have a bearing on basic faith that have been tampered with? We know, Noah, the Bible tells us why it was written. It was written for two reasons, and those definitions are in John chapter 20, verse 31. That says the books are written, so it's telling us why these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. So there's the number one reason why, that he's the Christ, the Son of God. And number two, that believing you have life through his name. So the two most important things in the New Testament are, who is Jesus Christ? He is Christ, he is the Son of God, and how are we saved? That we're, we're saved by believing in his name. Now, that very verse that you mentioned, 1 John 4, 3, where six words are omitted from the new version, they are, in essence, confessing that they are anti-Christ because we do not confess that Christ is coming the flesh. Those six words are taken out. Christ is coming the flesh in the NIV. This is the spirit of anti-Christ. The NIV says every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. Well, any new person, any Buddhist, anyone around the world would have acknowledged Jesus as a person, but they would not confess Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. So they are the spirit of Antichrist. Those who are listening out there and wondering, you know, who is telling the truth. The Bible is our plumb line. And in 1 John 2, 22, it says, Who is a liar? But he that did not that Jesus is the Christ. He is Antichrist. So the enemy omits Christ 43 times. That's why the most important reason why the New Testament was written, to attest that Jesus is not just a man named Jesus. He is, in fact, the Christ, or he is the Son of God. Now, in that verse, John twenty twenty one, it says that he might believe he is the Son of God. Now, in the new version, it can't be written to promote or to give honor to the Lord Jesus Christ because they consistently omit references to the Son of God. For instance, in First John five thirteen, the entire portion I'm about to read is omitted, and that ye might believe on the name of the Son of God. That's entirely taken out of the NIV. In Acts eight thirty seven. The youth that I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. That complete verse is omitted in the new version. In Ephesians 3.14, where it talks about the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. They take out of our Lord Jesus Christ. Ephesians 
3, 9, God, he created all things by Jesus Christ. Again, Jesus Christ is omitted in these places. It happens so many times. And we can see from this, it says right near that verse where you just read, Noah, it says, he is antichrist to deny the Father and the Son. Whoever denies the Son, the same hath not the Father. So by omitting the Son in all of these verses, they are antichrist by the Apostle John's definition. And it says they have not the Father. And we can see even in the New King James Version in Acts chapter 3 and Acts chapter 4 where the word Son is omitted and it's replaced by servant. So a version does not say that Jesus Christ is the Son of God or where it would omit as many as 43 times that Jesus is in fact the Christ. This is the spirit of Antichrist. So when I say that the new versions are Antichrist, or that they are preparing people for the Antichrist in religion. People think that I'm saying something that's unbiblical, but this is in fact a definition that is given by the Bible itself. The Bible is given to us, the latter portion of that verse says that believing we might have life through his name. Now, we know that the devil cometh and taketh away the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. The devil does not want people to be saved. And so I can give the listeners at least 20 verses in the new version where the devil taken away words that prevent people from having understanding of salvation. For instance, Mark 9.42, where it says that we need to believe in me, that's Jesus Christ. They take the in me out. They do the same thing in John 6.47. He that believeth on me hath everlasting life. It's first he take on me out. John 3.15, whosoever believeth in him has everlasting life. They take in him out. And so they're omitting the object of our faith. We can't just believe in crystal power or believe in pyramid power. We have to believe in him. We have been talking with Gail Ripmiger, author of New Age Bible Version and Which Bible is God's Word? She says many of the changes from the King James Version she'll discuss today are also found in the other modern versions because they all use the same Greek text. In her book, New Age Bible Versions, she lists changes in the modern Bible, which include changed or omitted words and verses. And all of it, she says, will prepare the churches of the last days to accept the religion of the Antichrist. Join me now as I continue the conversation with Gail Ripplinger, former professor at Kent State University. Gail, talk about some of the most significant changes you found in the New Bible Versions. We know in uh, Revelation 13, it says all the world worships the dragon. Okay, now we know there are crazy people in Waco, Texas. There were crazy people in Waco, Texas. But that doesn't say Waco, Texas. It says all the world worships the dragon. Now, we know what the dragon is. Revelation 12 says it's that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth who? The whole world. Now, how are we going to take the whole world, nominal Christians, nice little Buddhist people, how are we going to take these people and have them actually worship the dragon, worship the devil? And it's going to take quite a public relations campaign to transform his public image from his true evil character to one that would inspire worship. But it pivots upon the transformation of his identity. The new version and the new age fall right in line with his plan. Now, he said in Isaiah 14, I would like the most high. He wants the copy of God. He's a copy of The anointed sheriff wanted an identity change, okay? Yeah. And what he has done in the new version is change the wording of or the words that relate to God and deity to words that he can use as his persona. And I'll give you an example. Um, the editor of the New Age Journal, David Spangler, said, Christ is the same force as Lucifer. Okay, now we know as Christians that that is not true. Then in Isaiah 14, in the New Version, they remove the word Lucifer, Hillel in the Hebrew, from the, from the, the text there, and they substitute the word morning star. Now we know Jesus Christ in Second Peter 1, 19, is the morning star. And so, to say that Christ and Lucifer are the same thing, as that young student asked me about, um, is it, total blasphemy. And actually, the NSB puts a reference to 2 Peter 1, 19, right to Isaiah 14, trying to reinforce the idea in people's minds that Christ and Lucifer are the same force. Now, toward a world religion for a new age, the book by a, a young new ager called Lola Davis, and she said, when an appropriate common vocabulary is developed, each group can help toward a world religion. Now, Alice Bailey, everyone knows about Alice Bailey, the theosophist. She said in the New Age religion, God will not be a national or racial God. Not a Christian or his God, but this kind of neuter God. So look what happened in New Age literature. All of a sudden, in New Age literature, Buddha, Lucifer, and Krishna became the Christ, the Lord, and the One, capital O P. Now, what happens in the NIV and the NASB? They've matched moves with, with the mystics. 
and the word Jesus, Lord Jesus Christ, or Jehovah becomes the Christ, the Lord, and the one. So we have the same God as the Buddhist said. Okay, so the fill in the blank deity, like in First Corinthians fifteen twenty two, instead of saying Lord Jesus Christ, it's Lord. Or in Second Corinthians five eighteen, instead of being Jesus Christ, it's Christ. And so the personal Christian aspect of who our God is sort of disappearing. You know, it said in Jeremiah, latter days you, you shall consider it perfectly. I have not sent these prophets which caused my people to forget my name. It's in the Old Testament in Exodus six three and Psalm eighty eighteen. The word Jehovah is omitted, and the word Lord is in there. So the Lord Jesus Christ is gone. Jehovah is gone. And those are the national gods, if you want to say, Judaism and Christianity. And we just have Lord. And we've all heard of Lord Buddha, Lord Vishnu, Shiva, uh, Maitreya, who calls himself the Christ. And so these personal names are moving out of these versions. And, uh, you know, it's very sad to see the name Jehovah go out because Yehovah, Ye is the outstretched arm in a picture in the Hebrew language. Ho is a window, and Ba is a nail. And so we have God, the Father, stretching his arm out to sinful man and to the windows of heaven. And what do we do? We put a nail in it. And there's a perfect picture of God manifest in the flesh. And they just remove some of these beautiful pictures from the Bible. He was with Lord Buddha, or is that rock group out now called Enem, says Lord Faith. What about in the uh, case of the deity of Jesus Christ? Oh, they, they, they do horrible, horrible things to his deity. Let me give you some examples. And we know what we're looking for here is the Antichrist. In First John 2, 22, it says, He is the Antichrist that denies the Father and the Son. So you have to have both. You can't just have the Father, okay? Now, let me give you some examples that any of the listeners can look up. Okay, in the Bible, First John five thirteen, King James says, And that you might believe on the name of the Son of God. Okay, that's entirely omitted in the new verse. In Acts 8, 37, uh, the eunuch is being saved in this very verse. He said, I believe that Jesus Christ is what? The Son of God. That line is entirely omitted in the new version. But, you know, listen to this very carefully. In verse after verse after verse, the Lord Jesus Christ is taken out. Ephesians 3.14. Um, the new version say, I bow my knees before the Father. Well, we all know there's the Father, the devil. Your Father, the devil, Jesus talked about. King James says, I bow my knees before the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Galatians 7. In the new version, says an heir of God. King James says, an heir of God through Christ. Well, how are we an heir of God? We're not just an heir of God. It must be through Christ. Ephesians 3, 9. The new version says, God who created all things. King James says, God who created all things by Jesus Christ. So basically what we have here is Christianity and the new world religion. Uh, Galatians 4, 7. An heir of God through Christ. I could just go on forever. I mean, they just drop. Jesus Christ, every chance they get. The other thing that they, that's very bizarre, I think, is they take the word God, they take the word Jesus, and they take the word Holy One of Israel, or the only begotten Son, and it completely disappears, and it becomes the one, okay? Mm-hmm. Now, uh, InterVarsity had an interesting book out a few years ago called Unmasking the New Age, and it talks about this entity called the one, okay? Mm-hmm. And it says the one must move from the avant-garde fringe to the very heart of society as the new consciousness produces the new age. Now, there's a book called The Secret Doctrine. It's the Luciferian book. Okay. If you look in the index for that book, there's an entire page listing references to one. Lucifer is called the one. Okay. Uh, it's the Bhagavad Gita, the God, the God is called the one. The eight is in the Tibetan book of the dead, their God is called the one. So why are we taking out the only begotten son, the holy one of Israel, and just having the one? We know Satan is not holy, so he could be the holy one. He's just the one. Okay. Now let me give you an example of why some of this is happening. Edwin Palmer who is the chief architect behind the NIV, said, now well, listen to this heresy, the Holy Spirit did not beget the Son. Okay, now, the Holy Spirit did not beget the Son, but he's not the Son of God. He's not the only begotten Son of God. So the NIV takes out only begotten Son. Now, this is impossible. You cannot do this based on any Greek text in the world, because the Greek word there for begotten is monogenes. Okay, mono means one. Mm-hmm. This means Genesis, beginning, beget, you know, lots of different things you can use there. So they only translate the first part of that word, mono, and they call him the one or the one and only. Now, if you read back in history and look at some classical literature, you will find out, and I'll give an example, Layers of Babylon and Nineveh. They trace those titles, the one or the one and only, or the only one, to the serpent god of the Babylonians. So taking the only begotten son and turning him into this Hindu, uh, pantheistic, monistic kind of god is not... um, 
any kind of improvement? Or is it God, you know, getting advantage out of this? Who is getting an advantage out of it? I, I, I'm afraid that it's Lucifer that's getting an advantage out of it. There's another interesting phenomenon that you point out in your book, and that is the changing of the name of Christ, uh, God, Jesus, uh, and uh, the word He. Right, right. Um, the word Christ is taken out. The word Jesus is taken out. The word God is taken out. It becomes He. Okay, now let's look at the Bible. And uh, we know that there are two kingdoms. Okay? Yeah. You have heard of Satan's kingdom, and it says, If Satan be divided against himself, how shall his kingdom stand? So we know he has a kingdom. But we also know in Matthew 6, 33, that there's the kingdom of God. Now, what do new versions do? They say, instead of saying in Matthew 6, 33, the kingdom of God, they say, his kingdom. Now, uh, Revelation 13, 7 says, and power was given to him over all kindred and tongues and nations. Who is this him? This is the Antichrist coming up. And so, repeatedly in new versions, Jesus Christ disappears and it becomes a him person. For instance, 1 Timothy 3, 16, God was manifest in the flesh. Okay? Mm-hmm. New version changed up to he who was revealed in the flesh. Now, let's just look very quickly at the manuscript evidence for that. There are 300 expand brief manuscripts, 300, that attest to God. Okay? Yeah. There are seven that say who, and there are none that say he who. And so what does the NIV and the NASB have he who for? There's absolutely no Greek basis for this, and I challenge any Greek you know, theology professor to find it in a Greek manuscript where it says he who because it doesn't exist. So I was speaking to a Hindu gentleman the other day and witnessing to him, and quite frankly, um, I couldn't have done it from a new version. I had to explain to him God was manifest in the flesh. Um, the other thing that the new version do, Revelation 21.4, it says saying God shall wipe away all tears. It says he shall wipe away all tears. Um, Luke 24, 36 is Jesus, the new version of the T. Matthew 4, 18 is Jesus in the King James, the new version of the T. Mark 2, 15 is Jesus in the King James, the T. It's, it's, you know, where it says in Philippians 4, 13, I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. Well, we sort of have this international Bible that says in the new version, I can do all things through Him who gives me strength. And who is the He, Him person? Is God benefiting from this? You know, I, I don't think God is benefiting from this. What about, uh, we've been looking at uh, the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. What about the Holy Spirit? Are there any changes regarding the Holy Spirit that you took note of? Uh huh. Well, those changes are very frightening to me, quite frankly, because the Holy Ghost is disappearing. The Bible talks about if any receive another Jesus, if any receive another gospel, if any receive another spirit. So when you take that holy word away from the Holy One of Israel or the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit, you just have to... Spirit. I, I found probably a half a dozen or a dozen places where the Holy Ghost disappears and we just have this spirit thing. And I'm wondering, uh, I've read a number of commentaries by Hort, some of these people, and they say that this is purposely done on their part, that they think we receive a spirit, not the Holy Ghost, because as necromancers, that's what they were receiving. They were receiving this spirit, you know. My guest today on His People is Gail Ritlinger, and we're talking about her book, The New Age Bible Versions, and she says such versions as the NIV, the NASB, the Living Bible, the Phillips, the New Jerusalem, all derive from a uh, what she says is a corrupt Greek text done by Hort and uh, Westcott. At this point, can you synopsize for us how all of these various changes are underscoring your belief that uh, they are preparing people for the kingdom of the Antichrist. Well, I'll give you an example. There's a verse in 1 John 4:14. 4, it says, so the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. That's, in essence, that's Christianity, okay? And we know in the New Age, we have a God, one of many, who sends a Son or an avatar with a message to be a Savior for each age, okay? So in the New Version, instead of saying the Gospel of Christ, it just says a Gospel. Uh, instead of saying, um, children, how hard it is for them that trust in riches to enter into the kingdom of God in Mark 10, 24, it says, children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It's completely eliminating um, but the portion that says them that trust in riches. Okay, They essentially teach a doctrine of work. Some Hebrews 4, 6, the new versions say that they don't enter in because of disobedience. And we know we don't enter in because of unbelief. But Galatians 5, 22, I sadly see the change of faith and faithfulness. Now, in Greek, pistis and pistos are not the same thing, and no one can pretend they are. Um, probably one of the saddest things I see, and you can see it marching across the television stage all the time, is this prosperity doctrine that's so prevalent in Christianity, and that is a perfect result of the new version. The new version substitutes the word rejoice okay, for pride. It's like in Second Corinthians one fourteen, it says you're rejoicing. Mm-hmm. James one nine says rejoice. Well, the new version they take pride in, be proud. We know God resists the proud. And to be not proud. But in the last days, 
that were warning Timothy, it says, men shall be proud. And uh, for the heated debate in the church today over the topic of self-esteem, I have found is the people who use the King James uh, see it, man, a little bit more low, or a little bit more lowly than the new version. The new version blasphemously in Psalm 8, 5, say, thou hast made him a little lower than God. Okay, now we know thou hast made him, meaning man, a little lower than the angels. We are not a little lower than God. We're, we're <laughs> eons lower than God. Um, as I was saying though, about the prosperity doctrine that's marching across the television these days, mm-hmm. Proverbs twenty one twenty one, uh, Proverbs eight eighteen, all over the place in the new version, they substitute the word prosperity for righteousness. Now, we people, Herbert Wolf on the NIV committee, admit that it's a not correct translation. I'll quote him. He said, "Listen to this: non literal translations enhance accuracy." Let's talk about double talk, okay? Now, now where did that quote come from? Uh, this is coming from Herbert M. Wolf on the NIV committee. This is non-literal translation enhanced accuracy. Now, did he, was he quoting, are you quoting from an article? I'm quoting from um, a book that was written about the NIV, and he's talking about their change from righteousness to prosperity. And this is what he said. The word normally rendered righteousness is translated prosperity, perhaps better understood as the reward, reward of righteous living. The abstract quality of righteousness does not fit. Okay, if the Greek word is righteousness, then we need to put the word righteousness there. We don't need to have Mr. Wolf's theology <laughs> thinking that if you are righteous, you will be prosperous. Because we know that uh, Paul said those who teach that gain is godliness are destitute of the truth. So the new versions, instead of saying godliness with contentment is great gain, in First Timothy 6, 6, they say godliness actually is a means of great gain. Or in Ecclesiastes 10, 10, Wisdom is profitable to direct. Okay. Mm-hmm. Nothing to do with success or money or anything like that. It's a new version saying wisdom brings success. So we have this success prosperity doctrine that uh, is, is harming so many people and their faith are going to be shipwrecked because when they find out that that is not Christianity, that we do take up our cross daily and uh, the rewards are on the other side. You know, they're not over here. Um, one of the things that makes me so sad, uh, a young man called me and said, pray that I would have a pure heart. And it's interesting, in First Peter 1, 2, uh, the King James says, pure heart, and the new version say heart. Hmm. Okay. So we have a kind of a, you know, the bride of Christ is beginning to look like the whore, I think. In Second Timothy 3, 17, it's just saying, be perfect. It's just adequate. Okay, so we don't want to be adequate, we want to be perfect. Um, yeah, well, I don't know if it's possible to do this, but uh, what would you say is uh, the finding in your research that struck you as the most shocking? Probably the most shocking thing that I found in my research was that in these manuscripts that the new versions are translated from, um, Vaticanus and Sinaiticus, they do not necessarily end with the book of Revelation, okay? Now, remember the book of Revelation that said not to add or take away anything from this book, okay? Yeah. They, they disobey that command, all right? And they add two other books. Those books are called the Shepherd of Hermes and the Epistle of Barnabas. Now, I got a translation of both of those, and the translation was written by one of the gentlemen, who was a, his name is Lightfoot, who's a member of West Cotton Horse uh, Seance Ghostly Society and a number of their other occult organizations. But anyway, um, in his translation um, to these deuterocanonical books, people are commanded to, one, take the name of the beast, two, give up to the beast, three, form a one-world government, four, most shocking of all, kill those not receiving his name, okay? And this is in the um, Shepherd of Hermes, okay? Now, Madame Blavatsky, many of your listeners may have heard of her. She's the arch Luciferian, probably the godmother of the New Age movement today. In one of her books, The Secret Doctrine, she's laughing at Canon Westcott, who evidently she knew back at that time, and she thinks, how can this man quote so often from the Shepherd of Hermes? Because doesn't he know this is occult literature? It's from, uh, those are exact words, it's from the Zohar and some of these other, and she says this is from pagan literature. Now, she thinks pagan literature is just fine, but she recognizes it, and we've got Westcott and Horton, these people, um, quoting it. But what I suspect will happen is that the um, New Age people have plans for a New Age Bible to bring all the religions of the world together. I've read about this in a number of their different books, and they are looking at the, what they call the material that was dropped from the Bible in the 4th century. Now, what was dropped from the Bible in the 4th century was the Shepherd of Hermes and the Pistol of It never actually was a part of the Bible, okay? But around 350, it was created and added on to these false texts, these Vatican and Sinaiticus manuscripts. And the church obviously thought that this was not true, and 
that's why Sinaiticus like, manuscripts landed up in a wave basket because these were garbage manuscripts. Okay. But the New Age is calling for these two books to be added to the Bible, and I believe that they will. And I believe that people will open their Bible and they will worship the beast. And they'll be using a, a Bible. Um, probably another scary thing that I found. If you look at the Our Father and the New Versions and you look at the King James, you will see the distinction that the Father there is different. It's not Our Father in Heaven who delivers us from evil. Okay? But it's your father, the devil, who's the god of this present evil world. And so I think everyone who has a new version needs to look at 11.2 and sit down with the King James Bible and with their Bible because the New Agers admit that this is the occult our father. And I suspect that legions of mainline churches, which are Christian in name only, uh, who recite the Lord's Prayer every Sunday as part of their liturgy, uh, in the last days, uh, as all this reaches its culmination, these church members will pick up their new Bibles provided in the pews, and they're going to recite Luke 11.2, uh, and they're going to fulfill the prophecy of Revelation 13.4. They're going to worship the dragon. Now, the, the men who lived at the time this corrupt version of the Our Father was created, Irenaeus and Church Tertullian and some of these church historians, they talked about this corrupt occult Our Father. And they talked about the man who wrote it, his name's Marcon. And I'll, I'll read what, what they said. Uh, Marcon and his followers had taken themselves to mutilating the scriptures, curtailing the gospel of Luke, okay, but they themselves shortened. Mm-hmm. Now, Madame Blavatsky is thrilled to death that Westcott and Fort um, had used this occult shortened our father. And she quoted that this is in her book. This is in this, her satanic book. It says, Modern Bible Criticism. Yes, she was living at the time of Westcott and Fort, which unfortunately became active and serious toward the end of the last century, that was 1881. Now generally admits we are indebted to Marcon for the correct version, even of the Lord's Prayer. Now, Marcon at that time was called the Beast by Irenaeus and Tertullian, and so he, his version of the Our Father is not something that we want to adopt. And that's the version that's in the New Bible. It's the New Bible, right, right. Today, we wrap up our conversation with Gail Ripplinger, the author of the book New Age Bible Versions. In this heavily documented volume, Gail says the authorized King James Version is Christianity's earliest and most widely used Greek text. And the modern versions, through changes and omissions and wording, have, according to Gale, paved the way for churches in the last days to accept the religion of the Antichrist. Gale, in your book, you state that five of the new version Bible editors have lost their ability to speak. Now, who are they, and what is the significance of that? You know, even Christians, okay, now I'm not suggesting that some of the men on new version committees, in fact, many of them were not Christians, but remember Zacharias in Luke chapter 1, verse 20? It said, because thou believest not my word, he lost his voice. He, he became the speechless sphinx, so to speak. And so uh, some of these men, men may be Christians. I don't think all of them are that lost their voice, but some of them may be. An example would be Kenneth Taylor. Now, everyone's familiar with the Living Bible. I understand that um, the 700 brothers just made a multi-million dollar deal to promote the, the Living Bible. Well, the Living Bible has a horrible history in terms of this losing their voice. Um, Time Magazine, July 1972, is quoted as saying, mysteriously halfway through the paraphrase, Taylor lost his voice and still speaks in a hoarse whisper. A psychiatrist who examined him suggested that the voice failure was Taylor's psychological self-punishment for tampering with what he believed to be the Word of God. So Kenneth Taylor still cannot speak. Okay, Now, Kenneth Taylor's uh, Living Bible is a paraphrase of Philip Schaaf's American Standard Version. Okay. I don't know if you can read that in the preface, but if you would say the, the history of the Living Bible, you can find that very e- easily. Mm-hmm. Well, Schaaf is another man who lost his voice. I'm quoting from his son's um, biography that was written around the turn of the century. It said, even as early as 1854, the warning was given. His voice so affected that he could not speak in public so as to be heard. Finally, by 1892, the power of articulated speech gone. A friend corresponds to Schaff. It is with great sorrow that I have learned of the affliction which has beset you. So, I mean, it's frightening that we would give our children um, the horrendous version where God is obviously taking away people's ability to speak. We know Proverbs, it says, Proverbs 10.31, the throwward tongue shall be cut out. Throwward means lying. Um, your listeners may be familiar with the J.D. Phillips translation. Yes. Okay. Now, you know I said that, that Westcott and Fort were necromancers, and yeah. they, they brought communication with the dead. J.D. Phillips, in his autobiography, A Ring of, The Ring of Truth and the Price of Success, he admits that he, too, was a necromancer. And he, talk, he talked about having visions 
or C.S. Lewis appearing to him a number of times. Okay, now, we know that people from the dead can't go from there to here. Okay, we read that in the Old Testament, and that necromancy is strongly condemned in the Old Testament, so we are not to try to communicate with the dead. But J.D. Phillips had a number of uh, health experiences. He went to uh, palm readers. Uh, in fact, he was such a, an esoteric type that the letters EST um, are all over the, the back index of his you know, life history there. If you think the EST is so important, you know. But anyway, uh, I'll read you what happened to, in his own autobiography about J.D. Phillips. He said, I was still doing a fair measure of speaking in schools and churches until the late summer of 1961. And then, quite suddenly, my speaking, writing, and communication powers stopped. So, um, there, there are a number of others. We don't have time to go into all of them today, but um, I think this is God's judgment for handling his word. He said that if you took the words out of his book, that he would take your part out of the book of life. Now, that doesn't mean he'll take away your eternal salvation, but he will take away your rewards and some of the blessings and things that he gives people, such as the ability to speak. Now, those are three. Can you list the other two? Now, I'm trying to think offhand. Um, Westcott was another one. Westcott lost his ability to speak, and I have quotations about that in my book. And uh, Tregellus. Now, Tregellus wrote a Greek text that was much of the emphasis for the Westcott and Hort text. And so the, the Greek text is where the root of the problem is, okay? And so Tregellus also lost his ability to speak. Exactly. I think with this five, I'm still counting. I don't think, you know, this happens later in life to some of these people, so maybe some of these new version editors are, have this bullet forward to them unless they repent. And I think that may have been what frightened um, Dr. Frank Logs. You know, he started looking into some of these things, and he realized that uh, it's within the power of each of us every day to repent. What has been the effect on the church of the new Bible versions, in your opinion? Well, Jesus said there'll be a falling away first, and then the man of sin will be revealed. Now, we obviously don't know who the man of sin is. We haven't seen him yet, okay? So what's going to happen before the man of sin is revealed? There's going to be a falling away. And it talks about in one of the minor prophets at the end of the Old Testament, it said that uh, there'd be a famine of the Word of God. And it said men would go from sea to sea, and they wouldn't be able to find the Word of God. And we can see that happening. I mean, I know bookstores where you can go in and you can't even find a King James Bible. And I myself have to drive uh, half an hour to find a King James church or someone that will not stand up there at the pulpit and uh, correct the King James Church. We don't have the first century church anymore. You know, we don't take up our cross daily because the new versions say, follow me. They don't say, come take up your cross and follow me. And so we don't have a holy church. We don't have a pure church. We don't have a clean church. Um, as I said before, the bride is starting to look like the whore. And it's, uh, in essence, I think that's what's happened. But, it, but it's, it's what Jesus Christ said. He said there would be a falling away. And when he was speaking of the Laodicean church, which is the church period we were in, he said they were lukewarm. Okay, they had Bibles. They go to church. But it's not the kind of a Christian that would die for Jesus Christ. It's not the kind of Christian who would take up their cross. It's the kind of Christian that um, wants prosperity. And they think that by following Jesus Christ, he will bless them. And when he doesn't bless them or when he doesn't heal them, well, I don't like you anymore, God. You must be mean. You know, this is, this is not the God of the Bible. And I would suggest to any of your listeners out there that they get a King James Bible and make certain that they spend more hours a week in the King James Bible than they do listening to Christian television, uh, Christian magazines, uh, even their local preacher. If they are spending more time listening to man than they are listening to God, you know, through the Bible, they, they will be deceived. And it says, and when they asked Jesus in Matthew 24, 24, what will be the sign of thy coming at the end of the world? He said, take heed that no man deceive you. Now, Gail, what about all those who use the new versions? They grow in Christ. Uh, those come to Christ through the preaching from the new versions. If, if they're so bad, how can these things occur? Uh, now, I'm not suggesting that, that someone can't come to Christ through a new version. Okay? But that doesn't mean it's the Bible. In other words, I could, I, I, I recall when I was first becoming a Christian, um, the idea of even thinking about Jesus Christ was a novelty. You know, it was rather new. And I remember I went and saw Jesus Christ Superstar and some other blasphemous movie about Jesus, but it got me thinking about Jesus, mm -hmm. okay? And now, I wouldn't suggest that someone sit in front of one of those movies for the rest of their life for, for spiritual food, okay? Christ, Jesus Christ takes us where we are, and he moves us on. And it says that we're supposed to grow, okay, in Christ. Um, but I think one of the things that's happened with the new version is that since we don't have the Bible that's blessed by the Holy Spirit, we have psychological problems, and again, psychology has entered into the church. And um, Now, what, what is that connection between the new versions and psychology? Okay, J.D. Phillips is just an example. Okay, J.D. Phillips is the author of the J.D. Phillips translation. And in his own autobiography, um, he talks about the psychosis 
the depression and the hallucinosis that characterized his whole entire life. Okay, and look at the church today. Okay, we're putting down our Bibles and we're picking up the 12 step program and all that sort of thing. And, you know, the Greek word spooky, uh, psychology is the word for soul, and the soul is the domain of God. Okay, it is not the domain of secular psychologists like Carl Rogers or Sigmund Freud or, uh, Young and these sorts of people who in many cases were called as Freud and Young. Uh, Freud himself said if he had his life to live over again, he would do, he would study psychic phenomena. So, uh, and we all know about Carl Jung had a spirit guy called Philemon. And so, um, the church is leaving the Holy Spirit and they're taking heed to seducing spirits. And these are the spirits of, or the philosophies of these like, psychologists that are sort of creeping into the church, even through the seminary psychology class. And what is the connection to the new Bible versions? Well, I think, you know, the Bible talks about the bomb of Gilead. Okay, that's the comfort of the scriptures. And First Thessalonians 4.18 is to comfort one another with these words. And I think people pick up new versions and they're not comforted anymore. You ask the question about the Holy Spirit, mm-hmm. right? And what had happened to the Holy Spirit in the new version? In the King James, the Holy Ghost is called the Comforter. Mm-hmm. Because what do you need, Bill, every day more than anything else? <laughs> comfort, okay? Yeah. In this world, you shout out tribulation, Jesus Christ. In the new version, they change that to match the Jehovah Witness version, okay? And they say he's the helper, okay? Now, what do you need today, Bill? A comforter or a helper? Mm, um, you probably need a comforter. And, uh, and I'm guessing that most Christians are like you. And I think that the comfort is taken out of the scriptures. And, you know, Christians are not getting answers to prayer. John 15, 7 says, If my words abide in you, you'll ask what you will, and it will be done in you. And Christians say, Why doesn't God answer my prayers? Um, you know, we look at the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace. And I think any Christian out there, if they were truly honest with themselves, knows they don't have peace. Knows they know that they do not have joy. Okay. Now, when Jesus said in John 6, 63, the words that I speak unto you, that's the Bible, they are spirit. Okay, there's something about the words of the Bible that, that are not the words of the Reader's Digest. Okay? Right. Now, we wonder why we don't have the fruit of the spirit. Because we don't have a Bible that has the Holy Spirit. We just have a Bible that has the Spirit in it. And so all of the things that the Word does for a Christian, you know, Acts 20, 32, it says the Word of His grace, which is able to build you up. Satan would love to have Christians who are not built up. Okay? Um, John 15, 3, it says you're clean through the Word. He wants to have dirty Christians so people can say, well, I'm better than them, certainly. You know? uh, Ephesians 5, 26 says we're sanctified and cleansed the washing of water by the word. So we've got a dirty church uh, who has false doctrine creeping in. You know, we see all of these crazy doctrines creeping in. Acts 26, 25 says, speak forth the word of truth. Okay. The devil does not want the truth to be known. He's the father of lies. Okay. Now, obviously, the only weapon the Christian has against the devil is Ephesians six seventeen, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Now, if you're standing there, Bill, you've got the breastplate of righteousness and faith on, you've got the helmet of salvation, you've got the whole thing, okay? Mm-hmm. You do not have the sword of the Spirit, what can the devil do? He can walk up to you and knock you down on your tail. And how many times have, have, have the new Christian church been knocked down on their tail? I mean, more often than we care to admit. The Bible says the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. Now, what does the devil want to do with this sword? He wants to put it in a sheet. He doesn't like it. You know, the new version omits fasting from prayer and fasting all over the place in the New Bible. But who cares about that? Who benefits from that? It says, this kind cometh forth not, but by prayer and fasting. So it's this kind, these evil spirits, they don't want the power of the Word of God, and so they're going to water it down. Uh, it says, Paul said during his early time, he said, we are not as those which corrupt the Word of God. And so corruption of the Scripture was taking place as soon as Paul would write these letters. People were corrupting, corrupting the Bible. Mm-hmm. Um, and so when you look at the Papra, the early Papra, Pap- T66, the earliest Papra, dated 175, agrees with the King James Bible. Now we have T75, okay, that's 200, 225 AD. That one does not. It's been corrupted and it agrees with some of the new versions because right at that time there were some men, uh, Pantheus, uh, Thacus, Ammonia Thacus, uh, Origen, who did not, who were Alexandrian. Okay, if you go to the library, and you look up Alexandrian theology. You'll find something interesting there. You will find uh, that Alexandrian philosophy is Western thought mixed with Eastern thought. Okay? And that's where these papra, these corrupt papra, these corrupt manuscripts came out of a merger of East and West. 
And that's why um, they're so favorable to the new age. Okay. You know, if you look up the history of theosophy, which is men of Lovatsky's Luciferian theory, you will find that it was started by Pantheus and Sagas. Now, these are the gentlemen who had the Alexandrian school um, who, as an offshoot, had, had, had learned their head's origin. Now, origin is credited, even by F.S. Bruce and some of these uh, liberal theologians, is credited as being the author or the root of the Vaticanus and Fanaticus manuscripts. So we wonder why these manus- manuscripts are so platonic, and it's essentially because they came out of Neoplatonism. One powerful argument that people use for the importance of the modern translations is that they're written in a language that everyone can understand. Uh, they're written in the modern individual language, not with these and vows and, and the archaic King James language, and therefore there is a need for the modern translation. How do you respond to that? Okay. Um, I, now, that what, you're, what you're saying is essentially um, a repetition of advertising. I was an advertising major for a while, so I sort of, I sort of can see past um, press releases and all that sort of thing. But anyway, what the Christian is repeating is what they've seen in magazine, magazine or television ads. Okay, now, I did an actual analysis using the flesh TK grade level indicator. Okay, it's a formula. It's kind of complicated. 0.39 times the average number of words per sentences plus 11.8 times the average number of syllables per word minus uh, 15.59. I mean, it's kind of complicated. But anyway, the West King Page organization uses that formula to come up with a grade level. They do it for the Reader's Digest and New York Times, and they help people who are writing determine what grade level they're writing at. Okay, now using this formula with all of the versions, uh, the King James, the NIV, the NASB, the King James comes out at the fifth grade level. Okay. okay. NASB comes out at the sixth grade level, and the NIV comes out at the eighth grade level. And so the reason for this, and any of your listeners can check this themselves, has to do with the number of syllables per word. Count the syllables in a sentence in an NIV. Count the syllables in a sentence in a King James, and it's always going to be shorter. And it's just simpler. Okay. Now, you mentioned the these and the thou. In English, Old English, ye, and some of those things, some of them mean plural, and some of them mean singular. And so when you just go to you, you lose that distinction. And when Jesus was talking to the Pharisees, he said, ye are of your father the devil, and then he, he began to be and thou. He's distinguishing his audience there. And so when you go to the new versions, you lose all that sort of thing. Now, Gail, what do you feel ultimately is at stake? Well, I think it's going to make a difference at the judgment seat of Christ. You know, I think you can ask us, you heard about it, uh, you had an opportunity to repent, and you didn't. And so I think there will be lost rewards there. I think there will be weakness in spiritual life. I think the church will be weak, just the way Satan wants it to be. And um, but, but Jesus Christ is the victor. We have to remember that. How would you answer those who say that uh, this is just going to cause division in the church? It's going to make us question the Bibles that we're using, and, and people, maybe they'll stop reading the Bible altogether. Okay. Well, that would be a real shame, and that would be the devil's victory. But the Bible says, mark them that cause division and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you have learned and avoid them. It doesn't say mark them which cause division and avoid them. So if, it's, if the people are contrary to the doctrine that we have learned, those are the ones which avoid, not people who, uh, you know, cause division. So we have to read the whole entire verse there. So, Gail, you're uh, telling the church, calling on the church to put aside the new versions and uh, get back exclusively to the King James Version? It says in Psalm 1, that if we um, abide by the rivers of water, and we know the rivers of water are is the living word, which is the Bible, um, that will bear our fruit in season. And we can see the corrupt fruit that's coming from the church today. We are in the Laodicean age, and we can see it in our own lives where we don't have the fruit of the Spirit, love, and joy, and peace. And I believe if we go back to the true word of God, the word of God that the church had had for 1,800, almost 1,900 years, and been stolen from us by the thief. We know that Satan comes immediately and steals the word. And as soon as someone becomes a Christian, the first thing that happens is someone tries to place a new version in their hand. And I think if the church goes back to the, the King James Bible, they're not the new King James Bible, but the King James Bible, the one that the saints have had for 1,900 years, I think we'll see uh, a beautiful church that will be a sweet odor in the, in the nostrils of uh, our Lord and Savior, Savior Jesus Christ. And wouldn't we all like to put a smile on his face? You know, he reached out of the windows of heaven, and we put a nail in his hand. And in order to pay him back for that, if we could do something for him uh, and honor him and glorify his name, and I think the King James Bible does that, um, I think it would be a blessing to him. And we could be a blessing, a more of a blessing to each other. Now, Gail, obviously you're not saying that the church has had the King James Version. That came out in 1600-something. You're saying, what, the, the Greek text that it was derived from? Right. Um, the King James uh, 1611 came from the majority Greek text. It was called the Texas Receptus at the time that it was used. And that is 
in the historic text that the church has used since the first century. And then uh, we were sort of switched in 1881 with a new Greek text. And we need to go back to the King James because that is the only Bible out today that's from the majority Greek text. Gail Ripplinger, the author of the book New Age Bible Versions, an exhaustive documentation exposing the message, men, and manuscripts moving mankind to the Antichrist's one world religion.